there remains only France. If we succeed in opening the eyes of her people to the fact that in a military sense they have nothing more to hope for, a breaking point will be reached. To achieve this, the uncertain method of a mass breakthrough, in any case beyond our means, is unnecessary. We can do enough for our purposes with limited resources. National Educational Television presents Legacy, a 10-part study of some of the forces which have influenced the development and shape of Western civilization. This is the eighth film in the series. It was made in France, and it is concerned with war. Within our reach, behind the French sector of the Western Front, there are objectives for the retention of which the French general staff would be compelled to throw in every man they have. If they do so, the forces of France will bleed to death. This is the Place de la Toile, the center of Paris. Here, under the Arch of Triumph, the French have buried and honor their unknown soldier, killed in World War I, dead for France. They do not know who he is, but they think they know where he fought, where he died. There is in France a place not shown on the maps, but it is there. It is in the north, and it is called the War Belt. And in the War Belt, there are desolate villages. And in the center of these desolate villages are the memorials for all the men who have been gone for 50 years. objectives of which I speak are Belfort and Verdun. The considerations urged above apply to both, yet the preference must be given to Verdun. One million, two hundred twenty thousand men fell at Verdun. It was the grimmest, longest battle ever fought. It was a battle that no one won, a battle tactically indecisive in a war we now know was equally indecisive. Half a million men lay dead in these pleasant fields. To detail it is impossible, but to understand it important because it was the end of the gladiator. He died here as the history of the West turned in another direction.
As with most battles, it starts with a map and an idea, both German. Within our reach, behind the French sector, there are objectives for the retention of which the French general staff would be compelled to throw in every man they have. If they do so, the forces of France will be bled to death. Chief of the German general staff, Erich von Falkenhayn, his idea, it made military history, slowly bleed your enemy to death, death by attrition. It was never the German plan to capture Verdun itself, only to slaughter it, only destroy the French forces protecting it, only annihilate the replacements. If the city of Verdun itself was captured, the lure would vanish. Verdun, then and now, an inert garrison town with a vile climate and a lethargic pace. The River Meuse, opaque and muddy, runs listlessly through its center. The countryside is sour. The north of France is not a joyful place, now or then. For two months, the Germans prepared, meticulous, secret, and thorough. A thousand heavy guns hidden in the woods outside Verdun, 10 new rail lines, road building equipment, grenades, sandbags, miles of barbed wire, and 72 battalions of tough, battle-honed men against less than 300 miscellaneous French guns and but 34 battalions. The German bombardment and attack was scheduled for the morning of February 12, 1916. What happened that night saved Verdun and France, at least temporarily, at least for 24 years. It snowed. It snowed for one full week. And during that time, the French forces braced. the snow stopped. The 20th was clear and bright, spring-like, they say. And on the 21st, the weather held. It was a good day. whistling explosion and its overcharged heat of furious metal and the great percussion shells whose thunder is that of the railway engine which crashed suddenly into a wall the thunder of loaded rails or steel beams the air is gutted and viewless crossed and recrossed by heavy blasts and the murder of the earth continues all around been shelled in Verdun, you know all about it. The woods are sliced down like cornfields. The dugouts burst, the roads blown into the air and changed into long heaps of smashed convoys and wrecked guns. Corpses twisted together as though shoveled up. You could see 30 chaps laid out by one shot at the crossroads. You could see men whirling around as they went up about 15 yards and bits of trousers caught and stuck on the tops of the trees that were left. 
you could see one of the 380s go into a house at Verdun by the roof, bore through three floors and burst at the bottom. The battle lasts over 10 months. Nine villages completely disappear. One, Fleury, changes hands 16 times before it vanishes. This is Julian Fessler, 2nd Lieutenant, 239 Infantry. Left leg shattered at Fleury, June 23, 1916. Also wounded at Fleury, a German cousin of Fessler's, also named Fessler. Yes, we're truly and deeply different from each other. But we are alike, all the same. In spite of this diversity of age, of country, of education, of position, of everything possible, in spite of the former gulfs that kept us apart, we are, in the main, alike. have no choice but to go as the weeks and the months go. The terrible narrowness of the common life binds us close, adapts us, merges us one in the other. It's a sort of fatal contagion. Eight miles from Verdun, 150 from Paris, the French had built 30 years before the strongest fort in the world, Fort Douaumont. If a battle 10 months long and eight miles wide can have a center, it was here, the impenetrable Fort Douaumont, a quarter mile wide, hulking over the terrain, solid and immense as the glory of France. Scrawled inside, one can still read the French legend, rather be buried under the ruins of the fort than surrender. On the fourth day of the Battle of Verdun, the German 24th Brandenburg Regiment stood one half mile off. Their legend, do more than your duty. They were brave men, the 24th, in a time of brave men. Three German soldiers from the 24th got inside, and within an hour, Fort Duamont was German territory. To exultant Germany, it seemed the collapse of France. To the demoralized French troops, to France itself, it was bitter beyond belief. They turned their guns upon their own fort and for eight months lay siege. They took it again in October, 100,000 men later. In a Holocaust, Statistics seem important. Send 10 soldiers to Verdun, four die. Four are wounded or disappear, two survive. Of the four who die, two are buried alive by the bombardment. Of the four wounded or missing, one is buried alive. Send 10 soldiers to Verdun, three are buried alive. June 11, 1916, 164 men of the 3rd Company, 137th Regimental Infantry, hold a line of trenches under continuous German artillery. By the next morning, two men are left. 
163 have disappeared. They are here, their guns on the parapet of the trench, on the ready, buried alive to a man. The earth around Verdun has not survived. Every square foot is torn, diseased. Corporal Robert Dreyfus, 16th Division of the 5th Infantry, delivered in the dark of night with his battalion to the front line during the furious fighting in June. Now a resident of Verdun and an expert on the battles there, to this day Mr. Dreyfus has no idea where his battalion located. Though under constant murderous bombardment, they did not see the enemy. Three quarters of the entire French army passed through Verdun and a million German men. This is Berthold Blecker, a cannoneer of the 38th German Regiment. In good part because of the cannons there, Verdun was the battlefield with the highest density of dead per square yard ever known. Cannoneer Blecker was wounded, then captured by the French near Fort Vaux after seven months on the shifting front line. After the war's end and his release, he returned to his farm in Westphalia, and he has never left it. He has no interest in visiting Verdun again, for it was 50 years ago. This is Obergefreiter Dietrich Emmerich of the 24th Brandenburg. One of the occupying troops, he spent eight months inside Fort Duhamont. Today a successful businessman, he travels constantly, though he has been repeatedly invited back to Verdun by various French veteran groups, he will not return there, ever, he says. This is Private Breton, 2nd Battalion, 42nd Division, 6th Alpine. He was born in Verdun and he lives in Verdun. He carried into battle at Verdun the battalion flag and somehow survived. He has lived off a pension since the war. He owns a bicycle. We're ready. The men marshal themselves, still silently, their blankets crosswise, the helmet strap on the chin, leaning on their rifles. I look at their pale, contracted, and reflective faces. They are not soldiers, they are men. They are not adventurers or warriors, or made for human slaughter. Neither butchers nor cattle. They are laborers and artisans whom one recognizes in their uniforms. They are civilians uprooted, and they are ready. They await the signal for death or murder. But you may see, looking at their faces, between the vertical gleams of their bayonets, that they are simply men. Each one knows that he is going to take his head, his chest, his whole body naked, up to the rifles pointing forward, to the shells, to the bombs piled and ready, and above all to the methodical 
and almost infallible machine guns. To all that is waiting for him there, and is now so frightfully silent, before he reaches the other soldiers, he must kill. They are not careless of their lives, like brigands, nor blinded by passion like savages. It is in full consciousness, as in full health and full strength, that they are massed there to hurl themselves once more into that kind of madman's role imposed upon all men by the madness of the human race. And one sees the thought and the fear and the farewell that grips their face. The end of the day is spreading a sublime but melancholy light on the strong, unbroken mass of beings of whom some only will live to see the night. The evening is making ready along with a vague and chilling menace. It is about to set for man that snare that is as wide as the world. Total French and German losses at the Battle of Verdun, approximately 420,000 identified known dead, approximately 800,000 gassed, missing, or unidentified dead. Further, since the end of the battle, approximately 150,000 unidentified German or French corpses have been recovered from the battlefield. Further, since the end of battle, previously unexploded shells have taken the lives or maimed countless French farmers and their families. The last officially reported casualty in the spring of 1964, an American soldier picnicking with his family set off to explore a damaged underground command post. He was buried alive when it collapsed on him.
collected in the military cemetery in the town of Verdun after the armistice were the bodies of seven French unknown soldiers. Six remain. The seventh, the seventh soldier was brought here by horse-drawn caisson from Verdun and interred here with all intended honors. And attended by continual ceremonious guard, including by governmental decree, at least one soldier from the Battle of Verdun. Here in the center of Paris, in the center of French consciousness. If one must have a monument, this massive bulk seems creditable. and magnificent Rodin guarding the gates to the city of Verdun. In June 1940, the Germans smashed through here in 24 hours, total dead, 300. From the distended face of France itself, an exultant cry for liberty as she supports a dying warrior. And history draws a straight line from the victory of 1916 to the defeat only 24 years later the physical and spiritual exhaustion of France in 1918 is parent to the catastrophe of 1940. For a decimated country and an exhausted people, the price of glory was finally paid. National Educational Television Network.